Good morning and welcome to worship here at St. John's in San Francisco. I'm Sam Lundquist, the associate pastor here at St. John's, and as always, so good to be with you today. Um, it's been a rainy and cold week here in the city, so I hope if you are around the area, I hope you have been dry and warm because it has been crazy out there. Uh, but hope you're doing well and uh, welcome to worship. We're glad you're here today. Um, we are continuing our new worship series called God's Last Word, and we'll be taking a look for the next uh, five weeks, including this week, uh, at the book of Revelation, which is not only a misunderstood uh, book, but it is also um, a, a, a part of scripture we don't spend a lot of time in. So I'm excited to spend that time with you over the next several weeks, and we'll get a chance to look at some of the themes and messages that we find in that book. Um, we'll get to our message in just a second, but a, a few quick announcements before we get started. Number one, uh, we've been telling you about our upcoming DIY day, and this is a new thing we're starting here uh, to help or to let some of our and invite some of our congregants who have amazing talents and gifts in uh, you know things like baking and uh, just crafts and different things that they create um, to share those talents with the rest of us, so we can learn a little bit um, and do them ourselves at home. So um, this coming. Sunday the 21st we are going to be making kombucha together and if, if you'd like to sign up for that you can shoot me an email or sign up um, online and all the details are in your email newsletter as well but that'll be this Sunday uh, right after worship in the fireside room so come on down and sign up if you can also wanted to remind you as the year starts uh, that uh, if you want to add a new um, rhythm of service to your routine, we would love your help with Harvest Food Pantry. We serve over 200 households and that number is rising. Um, 200 households right here in our sanctuary with groceries every week. We need extra hands to make that happen. So come on down to our building Saturdays starting at 7.30 a.m. to about 10 o'clock um, and uh, we'd love your help with that. Also wanted to remind you in terms of new rhythms to start your year, we have our meditation gathering every first, third, and if there's a fifth Wednesday, um, right here in our chapel, that's our downtime meditation time. And it is a mix of guided and self-guided meditation. And it is just a way to um, practice spending time in stillness, spending time in silence, and how that can, um, uh, you can bring that into the rest of your life with a little bit more peace and a little more calm. Um, so that'll be Wednesdays at 7.30. All the details are on our website. Um, also coming up, confirmation classes. If you have a middle schooler or a high schooler, um, we would uh, love to know if they're interested in confirmation. We'll be having our confirmation classes the first couple weeks in February. Pastor Teresa has all the details, so you can shoot her an email to get signed up for that. Everything else that's going on in the life of our community, you will always find on our website as well as our email newsletter. So make sure that you check those out and you're signed up for that. But also we wanted to remind you that we are always holding you in prayer throughout the week. Um, and that includes you, even if you're not with us physically, everyone who's connected to our St. John's family is in our prayers throughout the week. And if you have something special you'd like to share with us, um, and, and we'll send that to our prayer team and our pastoral team, the information to do so is on your screen. And uh, finally, if you would uh, like to respond to our ministry with your generosity, we are always very grateful for that. It is through your generosity that we're able to not only create this virtual space and share our messages online, but all of the things we do um, from our Harvest Food Pantry to our meditation time to our workshops here that we offer here at St. John's, um, that all happens through your generosity and your giving. Um, the information to give is on your screen now. Um, we are very, very grateful for your gifts. I hope you're doing well and do know that we are holding you in prayer um, now and throughout the week and uh, you are such an important part of our St. John's family. Um, with that, let us gather, let us quiet our hearts, quiet our spirits as we gather for worship.
We're back with week two of our new series, God's Last Word, and we're spending uh, time, as I mentioned, in the book of Revelation, this overlooked and uh, misunderstood portion of our Christian scripture tradition. And if you missed last week, um, let's get you up to speed. That was our first week last week, and we looked at the first chapter of uh, Revelation, and we talked about where this book, where all of these words come from. And they come from uh, John, who is in prison on the island of Patmos. Um, because of his work uh, as a pastor that threatened the Roman Empire at the time. And he's worried about his well-being and his safety, as well as the well-being and safety of his followers who who are out in different churches um, all across the region, and they're under violent threat by the empire that's around him. And so out of that fear and out of that concern, um, he, he doesn't have a lot of power, but he has the power to write. So he creates this epic imaginary um, poem um, to send to his people that is there to encourage them, to inspire them, to strengthen them, and move them in this incredibly difficult and challenging time. And it begins, uh, last week we spoke about, um, it begins with Jesus. It begins with fixing the eyes of his people on this bright light of Christ that shines brighter than anything that they might be facing in their own um, lives. And that bright, bright light um, is still present with them, even in circumstances that are hopeless, that reminds them that God is there seeing them and will bring them new life, even though it might not seem like it at the time. And so today we're moving into chapter two. And in our uh, chapter, excuse me, chapter two and three, uh, we'll only be reading a little bit of chapter two today. And John's vision continues. And he takes a look, um, or, or Jesus is speaking to seven churches, um, seven churches that John leads. And our reading today is the first of those seven statements. So here are these words uh, from the book of Revelation, chapter two. Write this to the angel of the church in Ephesus. These are the words of the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven gold lampstands. I know your works, your labor, and your endurance. I also know that you don't put up with those who are evil. You have tested those who say they are apostles but are not, and you found them to be liars. You have shown endurance and put up with a lot for my name's sake, and you haven't gotten tired. But I have this against you. You have let go of the love you had at first. So remember the high point from which you have fallen. Change your hearts and lives and do the things you did at first. If you don't, I'm coming to you. I will move your lampstand from its place if you don't change your hearts and lives. But you have this in your favor. You hate what the Nicolaitans are doing. And I also hate. If you can hear, listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches. I will allow those who emerge victorious to eat from the tree of life, which is in God's paradise. So seven churches. John today points our attention to seven different communities that he's connected to as a pastor. It just so happens, um, as I have been looking back on my own spiritual life, that is the number of different denominations and uh, church communities that I've been a part of during my life. And that's not just passing through or visiting, it's uh, an active participant in seven uh, different communities. The first ones I didn't really get to pick, I was born um, into a tiny little Presby church in East Moline, Illinois. That was my grandparents' church. Then we started going to an Evangelical Covenant church, which is uh, honestly very similar to a, a traditional mainline church. Uh, it's a traditional Swedish denomination, but that was my, my other grandparents' uh, church. They went there. 
Uh, my family moved and I found myself at an evangelical free church for a while. And then for a bit, I got back with the Presby's. Then I went off to college and started to, uh, you know, pick my own uh, paths and uh, make my own uh, decisions. And in college, I spent four years as a part of a black Pentecostal community. After that, a few years at a four square uh, charismatic church. And then um, another, uh, about a year at a large Episcopal church. And then another at a small UCC church. And then finally, I moved up here to San Francisco and I found myself at home with the Presby's again. So yeah, that adds up to seven denominations or different um, non-denominational communities that I've been a part of. And I have to say, I enjoyed being a church hopper. I found it really fun because each one of those communities taught me something different about my faith, about who God is, about what Christianity can be, and it opened up, uh, opened me up to all sorts of different people and the ways that they do things. Uh, at the Pentecostal church, I saw how the Spirit moved, physically moved people. We sang and jumped and shouted and um, danced uh, sometimes for three hours during our services, and I left church sweaty. Uh, the Foursquare Church that I was a part of uh, really showed me, I think for the first time, a community that was really connected and um, really did life together and shared um, things together and built strong relationships with one another. The Episcopal Church helped me think deeper and slow down a little bit. I got to hear lectures from amazing people. Desmond Tutu showed up at one point, which was incredible. And the church introduced me to spiritual practices like centering prayer and meditation. At uh, that small UCC church, we always had a pop song in the middle of our service so we could um, really make note of the ways that God is connecting to our everyday lives. And honestly, we probably wouldn't have a Dolly church if I hadn't experienced that at this UCC church. There was, uh, there was something really special about all these communities, and I really felt connected, or a part of me felt connected to each one of them um, in a different way. But of course, they weren't perfect. Some of them were definitely not perfect for all sorts of reasons. And I realize now that looking back at that time, I, I was really, a part of me was looking for a perfect place. I needed a perfect place. I wanted a place that did it right, where I felt safe and right. And that's the reason I jumped around, um, was because I just didn't find it, um, and I kept moving until I found it. It took a while for me to realize that uh, perfection was never going to happen. And uh, eventually, I discovered that God had something even better in mind. Well, revelation, um, as we heard last week, it means to lift the veil, to go behind the curtain, um, so to speak. And this week, our scripture lifts the veil on seven churches to show us what's going on behind the scenes. First, uh, here are the ones, we heard about one today. Here's the ones we didn't hear about. One church is a poor church, but a faithful church. But because of the uh, circumstances, the political issues, and, and uh, the, the way they are um, in tension with uh, the, those in power, many of them would be headed to prison soon. So there was a danger in this church. Another is proclaiming Jesus's name, but hypocritically acting in ways that uh, wouldn't, are not moral and, and do not fit with proclaiming the name of Christ. One is doing more good works than ever before, and they're growing. They're doing amazing, but their leader is also preaching evil. Another has a really good reputation. Everybody knows them, but in reality, they're kind of sleepy, and they're not really doing a whole lot in this world. One is small and strong, kind of like the first one, but very powerless and not very, a not very safe place to be. Another is rich but indifferent and miserable. And today, uh, in our scripture passage, we read about uh, a church that does good works, does them very well, has endured great challenges, stands up to evil, but they've forgotten to love, and they've forgotten the love that they once had for one another. So if we're pulling back the curtain, we find seven churches that have a lot going on. And if we're pulling back the curtain, we find seven churches that are nowhere even close to perfect. Each one has problems, some of their own making, some the result of the political, um, uh, imperial, imperial uh, economic world around them that makes their communities um, very challenging to be a part of. But by no means are any of them perfect. 
They are very, very messy. And yet, that messiness, the church, is still in these words of revelation, the end of the story, God's vehicle for goodness and renewal and restoration in this world. That is why here at the end of the story, Jesus is still calling out to the churches. Eugene Peterson says, uh, the churches of Revelation show us that churches are not Victorian parlors where everything is picked up, ready for guests. They are messy family rooms. They are living rooms. And if the persons living in them are sinners, they're going to be clothes scattered about, handprints on the woodwork, and mud on the carpet. There is nothing particularly glamorous about churches, nor, on the other hand, is there anything particularly shameful about them. They simply are. Churches simply are. It is a very uh, human thing to want perfection, especially when life is shaky, when things themselves are so imperfect and uncertain. We can often, in those situations, do a pendulum swing and demand that everything, just for a second, be perfect so we can stand still for just a second. And remember, that was the case for John, who is writing here to communities that are in very dangerous circumstances. Life was very unstable, very uncertain. People didn't know if they would be taken away, where they would get their next meals, which places and which people were safe for them. But here we see that John does not point them towards perfection. Yes, he acknowledges communities that have some reorienting to do. But instead of demanding perfection, he opens up this big picture, big picture of messiness, showing all of his communities that while they're all challenged by different things, Jesus hasn't given up on those communities. And Jesus still sees them and calls out to them. When we make perfection our goal, we lose something because perfection is impossible. And the pursuit of it leads us to frustration, to disappointment. It makes us hard on ourselves and hard on others as well, especially in community together. And so instead, here in God's last word of revelation, we see this reminder that we need messiness in community. There is something in that messiness that saves us, but only if we're open to it. And that's why John's words, they end with Jesus repeating one thing over and over and over again. At the end of each of these proclamations, Jesus says, if you can hear, listen to what the Spirit is saying. So instead of a community of perfection, John calls out to his people to be a messy community that listens. Messy communities try new things. They're not afraid to do that. And they listen to the wisdom of what happens when they try new things, and then they try things again. Messy communities know that differences are a good and wonderful thing, and messy communities listen to the true and different experiences that people have. Messy communities allow people to make mistakes, to fall, to fail, and then give them words of compassion and encouragement to listen to. Messy communities listen to the concerns of their people and move their energy into caring for people whose lives have gotten a bit messy. Messy communities listen to their neighbors and risk opening their doors and their resources to respond to the needs of this world. Communities that demand perfection have one way of doing things. Messy communities listen and move with the Spirit. They recognize with joy that we will never quite get it right because that is real and that is human and that is how we grow. If you were here in the building, you, uh, you may have noticed or you would notice that uh, we got our carpet cleaned within the last week. It looks all bright and shiny and new because we had made it 
pretty messy. We had wax stains from Christmas Eve. We had paint stains from art projects. We had dog hair from all of our furry friends that we love on Sundays. We had mud from rainy days when people came in um, just because they needed a warm and dry place for shelter. We had chocolate blobs from cookies and brownies and barbecue sauce stains from potlucks and banana goo from our food pantry on Saturdays. The carpet was messy. It wasn't perfect. And that is good. That is so, so good. Because it means that people live here and love here as best as they can. And all those carpet stains that you guys all made, <laughs> I did too, uh, they added to the scratches on the floors and the nicks on the walls and the chips in the paint that have come from all of the ways that this messy community has opened up its doors and listened to the Spirit and loved for over 150 years. You are a messy community, St. John's. I'm proud to be a part of it. And I wouldn't have it any other way for us. You have opened your doors for other messy people to know that they are seen and safe and sound and accepted here, no matter what they're going through, no matter what messiness is in their life. You have shared life's wisdom and life's encouragement with others and helped them in life's messy, messy moments. So I pray I pray that we keep being messy. May we be a messy people, St. John's, with open hearts, always listening to where the Spirit is calling us towards one another, towards our neighbors, and towards our amazing God who sees us and loves us exactly how we are. Amen. My friends, it has been a pleasure and a joy, as it always is, to be with you um, in this time of worship and this time of praising and proclaiming our amazing God and the love that God has for us. May you go into this week being messy, risk a little bit, love a little bit more, have some courage, and have some trust that there is a God above you that loves you so much and sees you Christ walks this earth with you, your constant friend, your constant companion, and the Holy Spirit dwells within you always, warming your heart with the words, I love you. May you go in peace and go in love. Amen.